فريق في السعير ولو شاء الله لجعلهم أمة واحدة ولكن يدخل من يشاء في رحمته والظالمون ما لهم من ولي ولا نصير أم اتخذوا من دونه أولياء فالله هو الولي وهو يحيي الموتى وهو على كل شيء قدير وما اختلفتم فيه من شيء فحكمه إلى الله ذلكم الله ربي عليه توكلت وإليه أنيب ذلكم الله ربي عليه توكلت وإليه أنيب ذلكم الله ربي عليه توكلت وإليه أنيب فاطر السماوات والأرض جعل لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا ومن الأنعام أزواجا يذرؤكم فيه ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير له مقاليد السماوات والأرض يبسط الرزق لمن يشاء ويقدر إنه بكل شيء عليم شرع لكم من الدين ما وصى به نوحا والذي أوحينا إليك وما وصينا به إبراهيم وموسى وعيسى أن أقيموا الدين أن أقيموا الدين ولا تتفرقوا فيه كبر على المشركين ما تدعوهم إليه الله يجتبي إليه من يشاء ويهدي إليه من ينيب وما تفرقوا إلا من بعد ما جاءهم العلم بغيا بينهم ولولا كلمة سبقت من ربك إلى أجل مسمى لقضي بينهم وإن الذين أورثوا الكتاب من بعدهم لفي شك لفي شك منه مريب سبحان الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله حمد كثيرا طيبا مبارك فيك من يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله وكنا سيء وكاشا ما سبحان الله العظيم I literally could stand in, in prayer all night behind him man. سبحان الله العظيم Some people were just born to recite Quran man. Just born to recite May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve and protect uh, our sheikh, our imam, our brother, uh, Ukasha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wherever he is around the world, who, no, who you never know what part of the world sheikh Ukasha is in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always keep him protected, always keep him safe. Bi idhni lahi ta'ala. He's much needed in our communities. Okay. So. We've already discussed at the beginning, alhamdulillah, for those of you who have donated, I've seen some donations come in, alhamdulillah, your donations are much appreciated. Please continue to donate. We cannot purchase this facility without your help. Please continue to donate, inshallah ta'ala, large sums. We need small sums, but we also need large sums as well, 1,000, 2,000, 2,500. We need large sums, inshallah ta'ala. As the days go by, inshallah ta'ala, we will do some larger fundraisers. Uh, these small, you know, um, these small lump sums, they do add up. 
but we definitely need some heavy hitters. We need those who, you know, have their checkbooks, those who, you know, can write a check, those who can send a donation, $2,500, $5,000. And alhamdulillah, it's just a drop in the bucket for them. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you who've donated, who've continued to donate, who continue to support our effort. You are much appreciated. Okay, so Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, we stopped at his advice to, uh, to his daughter, Hafsa. And we all heard what he said to Hafsa. His last words to Hafsa were, you know, do not talk back to your husband, the Prophet wasallam. Don't ask him for more of this dunya. You know, don't burden him with, you know, being distracted by trying to go out and amass, you know, all of the riches of the world for you. You know, taking him away from his real mission. Don't task him with that. Don't burden him with that. If you want something, ask me. Ask your father. And don't be tempted to imitate your co-wife, Aisha, in her manners and her treatment towards the Prophet Sallallahu for she is far more charming than you are and far more beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu than you are. I.e., he will divorce you before he divorces her. Okay. So... The Quran and the Sunnah, they don't necessarily give us a timeline of, you know, how, how much time has passed between certain incidents. However, some time passed, and Umar, he continues in the same narration. He said, وَكَانَ مَنْزِلِي بِالْعَوَالِ فِي بَنِ أُمَيَّةِ وَكَانَ لِجَارٌ مِنَ الْأَنْصَارِ كُنَّ نَتَنَّاوَهُ النُّزُولِ إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَيَنْزِلُ يَوْمًا فَيَأْتِينِي بِخَبْرِ الْوَحْيِ Umar he said, I used to live in the area of Awali in Medina. All right, and this was the area of the tribe of Bani Umayyah. And I used to live in this area in Medina, which was kind of far, which was a, a ways away. Even now, the area of Awali it still exists today in, in Medina. And it's a, a, it's a nice ways away from the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid. He says, so me and my neighbor from the Ansar, I had a neighbor who was from the Ansar, and, and me and my neighbor, we used to go uh, take turns going down to spend time with the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi in the city, in Medina, right, at the Masjid. So one day I would go down and I would spend my day with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam learning about what revelations were revealed during that day, hearing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, following him around, learning from his mannerisms. And then I would come back to my neighbor and I would convey the information to him of whatever, whatever was revealed that day. He said, and my neighbor would go down and do the same. The very next day, my neighbor would go down. And the reason why Umar did this was because a lot of the, uh, the Sahaba, uh, especially those migrants who came from Mecca to Medina, the main source of commerce in Medina was, you know, uh, vegetables, growth, vegetation. So they, were, they now became farmers. You know, we took people from the inner cities of Mecca, uh, where they were around the Kaaba selling their merchandise. They were merchants. Most people were merchants. Some people had, you know, businesses or whatever the case may be. But then they get, and there was no growth of vegetation. So any fruits and vegetables that were in, uh, in Mecca were imported from outside. Now they migrate to Medina and many of them have to learn how to make money now, you know, because the main source of commerce is, is farmland, it's green, it's greenery. You know, even if you go to Medina and you can see the difference between what Mecca looks like in contrast to what Medina looks like, you know, when I got to, when I the fir very first time that I ever went to make Umrah, I went to Mecca first. I got off in Jeddah and I took took a cab to Mecca. Got to Mecca. Mecca is just rural area, you know. Just you know, at that time, it, it looks nothing like it looked today. Uh, but you know, old you know hotels, you know those hotels that have the, the you know the air conditioners in them. You know they may work, they may not work. You know even if they do work, they're not blowing out cold air, so you're still sweating. You know you have this little hotel room. You can kind of look out and you can see the Kaaba from your hotel room, which you can't necessarily do today unless you're in one of those clock tower uh, hotel rooms. Other than that, you won't be able to see the Kaaba from uh, your window. And so, um, 
when I got to Medina, I got I took the bus from uh, from Mecca to Medina. When I got off the bus in Medina, it was just like, ah, you know, you 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 get off the bus in Medina, it's just the whole atmosphere, everything, the people, the atmosphere is just it's just different. Medina is just different, and uh, so migrating from Mecca to Medina for many of the Sahaba it was it was a it was a change. It was a it was a huge transition. And so Umar is, you know, dealing with now being a farmer, growth, vegetation, fruits, vegetables. So he can't go down every day because he has to water, you know, so he's watering his, you know, his garden. He's watering his neighbor's garden. And the neighbor would go down, seek knowledge, come back and share with him. And then Umar would go down the very next day. And so it was a very wise thing to do. And it's something that students of knowledge, those who are you know, going overseas to study, you know, to have a partner with you where maybe one day he works or he tutors, you know, there's a lot of students of knowledge. But one of the things that we used to do to earn money would be to tutor, you know, tutor, you know, maybe you have a neighbor who speaks Arabic and wants to learn English. So you learn how to tutor. So one of my neighbors, she had a son and a daughter. And, um, and I used to, you know, two days out of the week, I used to tutor, you know, her children, you know, they live right next door to me. You know, so alhamdulillah, it was a way for me to make money, you know, on the side. You know, you're a hustler, you're a hustler. You know, you're going to find your way. It doesn't matter. So, you know, alhamdulillah, that was something that I, you know, used to do to earn money on the side. Um, and so they used to take turns going down. So Umar is giving us a glimpse at his life right up to the point where this incident happens. So Umar said, وَكُنَّا نُحَدِّثُ أَنَّ غَسَّانِ so we all used to talk about the tribe of Ghassan who were, you know, threatening to attack us. You know, we, this was the talk amongst the Sahaba that Ghassan, with Ghassan, these were the Arabs from the north, further north, going up towards where Damascus and Syria is, right at the tip of the Arabian Peninsula before you cross over into Syria, all right, and Sham or that area. So this was the area that belonged to the tribe of Ghassan. Eventually, they did go to war with the tribe of Ghassan in the Battle of Mut'a. Mut'a. And so they were talking about, so this, this incident was before the Battle of Mut'a. And so they were talking about the uh, Ghassan eventually attacking them. They were sending threats that they were going to attack the Muslims. The Arabs from up north, they were not really feeling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba and this newfound notoriety that they had in Medina. They weren't really feeling it. And eventually they went to war with them. But Omar said, talk was, you know, going around about Ghassan, you know, the tribe of Ghassan attacking us. He said, فَجَاءَنِي يَوْمًا فَضَرَبَ عَلَى الْبَابِ He said, so my neighbor came to me one day. I'm at home. My, my neighbor comes and, I, and I, I hear him knocking on the door. Knocking on my door. So I rush to the door. Obviously, when you hear someone knocking on your door like that, it's there's there's an urgency there. So Umar says, So I rush to the door. فَخَرَجْتُ إِلَيْهِ فَقَالَ حَدَثَ أَمْرٌ عَظِيمٌ حَدَثَ أَمْرٌ عَظِيمٌ He says, So Umar says, So I ran to the door, I got to the door, and when I came to the door, he says to me something. Horrible has happened. Something horrible has happened. So Umar radiallahu the first thing he's thinking about, he said, Aja'atna al Ghassan. He said, Did the tribe of Ghassan come to Medina? Are they attacking us? This is where Umar's mind is. If someone comes to you and says, you know, something horrible has happened, terrible has happened, the first thing you're thinking is the worst thing. That could have happened in that moment. And for Umar, the worst thing that could have happened in that moment was being attacked by the tribe of Ghassan. But that wasn't the worst thing that happened. So his neighbor, he said, He said, no, something far more horrendous than that. Something way terrible, much more terrible than that. Umar said, well, well, what could be worse than that? I want you to pay attention to this. Because this is the way that they viewed divorce in their community. Horrible. Whereas today, divorce is like second nature. It's like, <laughs> oh, so-and-so got divorced. Oh, okay. It's, it's like it's nothing. So, 
Okay, inshallah, you can email me, inshallah, or DM me, and I'll, I'll, I'll share the information. Jazakallah khair. All right? Um, but I want you to see how they view divorce. He says to Umar, something terrible has happened. And the first thing that Umar thinks of is, well, did Ghassan attack us? Are we being attacked? He said, no, something far worse than that. What could be worse than that? So the neighbor, he said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, oh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam divorced his wives. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam divorcing his wives was worse in their estimation than being attacked by an outside group. You think about that for a moment. This is the way that they view divorce. Not just divorce of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not just divorce, but the leader of the community divorcing his wife. It was it, it impacted everybody. Divorce doesn't just affect the two people involved. Divorce has a ripple effect within the community. It affects the children that are involved. It affects you know the families that you know were merged. It affects the families. It affects the Muslim community. It causes you know people to you know start now to choose sides. So whereas the husband and wife used to have mutual friends, now that they're separated, this group of friends have to go with that group of have to go with that spouse, and this group of friends have to go with that spouse. So now they have to choose. This is a ripple effect throughout the community. So he said this was worse than being attacked. The Prophet The Prophet divorced his wives. Not just one, all of them. <laughs> and for any man in polygyny, you know that feeling. That feeling where you feel like you are overwhelmed by all of the women that are involved in that situation and you believe that the quickest way to relief is to just get rid of all of them. I will divorce every single one of you. <laughs> right? Because it's overwhelming sometimes. It's one, it's, it's, it's one thing to deal with you know, being overwhelmed by whatever trials or tribulations that you're experiencing from one wife, but to catch that from two or three or four, however many wives you have, to catch that from all of them at the same time is enough to overwhelm any man. Polygyny, here again, is not for the faint of heart. And there are some men that are just not built for it. There's some men that are just not built for it. You try your hand in it and you realize, man, I'm going to leave this for the, for the brothers who you know can handle that because I am not built for this. <laughs> so he said the Prophet ﷺ divorced all of his wives. So Umar now, he's upset because the very thing that he was trying to warn Hafsa about actually happened. Right? The very thing that the Prophet, that, that Umar was warning his daughter about has now happened. This was he, this is what he feared. So Umar he said, fi nafsi. So I said to myself, He said, Hafsa is a loser. Hafsa is ruined. This was the very thing that I thought was going to happen. This is Umar talking to himself. He says, so I said to myself, Hafsa is a loser. Hafsa, Hafsa is ruined. This is the very thing that I feared would happen. This is a father who's now affected by the you know, possible divorce of his daughter. Is giving an inside glimpse that when the news reaches a man that his daughter, his baby girl was divorced by her husband. It's a blow. It's a blow as a father. You take that blow to the stomach like, man, you know, especially if you saw, you know, this coming. This was, you know, impending. You know, you saw the impending divorce because of possibly the behavior of the wife or the behavior of the husband. And you saw, you know, things, you know, manifesting within their marriage. And so you... As, as, a, as a father, you're kind of foreseeing that this is probably going to end in divorce. And then when the news of the divorce is brought to you, you're like, man, this is exactly what I knew was going to happen. So you can, you can feel Umar's disappointment, right? So Umar said for, uh, that he put on his clothes, right? He put on his clothes, he got dressed, 
and he went to go visit Hafsa. He said, فَلَمَّا صَلَيْتُ الصُّبْحِ شَدَّتُ عَلَيَّ الثِّيَابِ ثُمَّ انْتَلَقْتُ حَتَّى دَخَلْتُ عَلَى Hafsa. He said that I got dressed, I went down, and I prayed Salatul Fajr. I prayed Salatul Fajr, I put my clothes on, and I went down to Hafsa's house. I gotta go see my daughter. I got to, I have to go confirm that she's actually divorced. Here again, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that when a sinful person brings you some news, this doesn't mean that the, the companion from the Ansar was sinful. Nonetheless, we should verify the news when it's brought to our attention. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if, you know, a sinful person brings you some news, then verify it. At least you harm a person in ignorance and then afterwards when the truth oops, excuse me when the truth of the matter that is not gonna work. Okay, so let's clean that off. Alright. When the truth of the matter is revealed to you, give me some uh, some tissue. That could have been really ugly. Okay. Got it. So when the truth of the matter is revealed to you, then afterwards you're going to be regretful. All right? So that's the eye. So if... Right? If some... Uh, if some uh, sinful person brings you some news, then verify it. And it doesn't matter whether the person is sinful or not, you should still verify all news that is brought to you. And verify it, for at least you harm a person in ignorance, and then afterwards you are regretful. So, Umar, he said, I put on my clothes, I pray Salat al Fajr, I put on my clothes, and I go down to Hafsa's house to go visit Hafsa. I need to verify this. I need to find out whether or not this is the truth. So, Omar, he gets down to Hafsa's house. He enters upon Hafsa. He said, so I entered upon Hafsa, and there she is crying. Hafsa's crying. You walk into your daughter's house. You heard that she's divorced. You walk into your daughter's house, and there she is crying. Just want to make sure no water got in here. He said, so I entered upon Hafsa, and when I entered upon her, I saw her crying. All right. So obviously Hafsa, she's probably under the, uh, the impression that she's divorced as well. She doesn't really know at this point. As Umar's going to ask her, is she divorced? And her response is, I don't know. All right. So she doesn't know. She, she thinks she is. News is spreading. You know, information is spreading very quickly throughout the community. And so, um, Omar said that I entered upon Hafsa, but either he had and she's crying. فَقُلْتُ أَطَلَّقَ كُنَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ He said, so I asked her, did the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم divorce you guys? I need to, I need to confirm this. Is my daughter divorced? Did the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم divorce you guys? And uh, Hafsa, she says, لَا أَدْلِ هُوَ ذَا مُعْتَزِلًا فِي هَذِهِ مَشْرُوبًا she said, I don't know if I'm divorced. He has boycotted us. He has taken an oath to stay away from us. And he has isolated himself in this room above the masjid. This little mushruba was, uh, it had a couple of steps going up. It was like an attic area above the masjid. All right. And so he's now away from his wife, boycotting his wives, staying away from them. Here's the Prophet وسلم, seeking a place of peace wherein he can make a reasonable and logical decision. All right. And that was the that was the nature of the khutbah. All right. The nature of the khutbah in which I gave this initial talk during the khutbah was a man trying to find a place of peace where he can make a logical decision. Sometimes the noise is too loud and making a decision is more of a reaction than it is a response. In the words of Sister Nayela, 
Learn how to respond rather than react. There's a difference between reacting and responding. And so a lot of times when we the noise is too loud, the noise level is too loud, metaphorically, this means that there's so much going on, we don't have a quiet place to retreat to wherein we can make rational, logical decisions. And so we give in to the noise and we react. And usually when we react, you know, the, you know, the consequences of that is usually catastrophic. Right. Usually when we react, the consequences are catastrophic. So very important for us to understand the difference between reacting and responding. All right. Can you guys on Instagram, can you guys hear? You guys on Instagram, can you hear? Just want to make sure I didn't kill the sound. Okay, great. So now the Prophet Sallallahu he has decided that he's going to, he took an oath actually, he took an oath to boycott his wives, to stay away from his wives, all right, that I'm being overwhelmed. Now the question is, what is it that caused the Prophet Sallallahu what did his wives do that made him react like this? What caused him, um, it's going in and out. On Facebook? Can you guys hear on Facebook? Or do I need to restart it? You guys on Facebook, can you hear? Okay. All right, so what caused the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, here's the, here's the question, what caused the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to decide to boycott his wives? And what is the, you know, what is the extent of the boycott? What does that entail? And can a man boycott his wives? Or can a, can a man boycott his wife? And if, if he can, then how long? These are all of the questions that kind of come up um, in this situation, all right? So these are some of the things that we are going to seek to answer, right? Can a man boycott his wife? What is a boycott? What does that entail? How long can a man boycott his wife? His wife. And why should a man boycott? What are the parameters? These are all things here again, things that are not necessarily clarified, you know, not necessarily clarified in our religion. Because people who just kind of throw it out there, it's like, oh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam boycotted his wives. Okay, but then my question is, what caused him to boycott his wives? What constitutes boycotting? How long can that be done? But I have so many questions, and I'm sure that many of you guys do as well. If there's any woman that is listening, who your husband, you have been a victim of this. Your husband has boycotted you. I'm sure you have the same questions that I'm mentioning right now. What did I do for you to boycott? What constitutes boycott? How, how long does this last? You know, what rights do I have in this situation? Am I to just sit back and tolerate whatever behavior you're dishing out? What, what are the parameters here? And these are the things that need to be answered. All right. Something that I do with my students when we are introducing a new concept to children where we're teaching, we use the power of the five W's. You know what the five W's are? Who, what, when, where, and why. That's the five W's. If you answer those five questions, whatever subject matter you're covering will usually be clear after that. The who, the what, the when, the where, and the why. This is called the five W's. Any good teacher will use this strategy when introducing a new concept. When you're introducing a new concept to someone who has never heard this concept before, you have to give them everything in that moment. Rather than just giving them, oh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam boycotted his wives. Okay, well, when did he boycott his wives? Why did he boycott his wives? Who from his wives did he boycott? How long did the boycott last? What are, what are the parameters of the boycott? What constitutes boycotting? 
You, you guys following me? These are important questions, not just, oh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam boycotted his wives and that's that. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about the why. Why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam boycott his wives? And then we'll talk about what boycotting is. What, it, what, what constitutes boycotting? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as it was mentioned by uh, many scholars, they differ as it relates to why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam boycotted his wives. Some of the scholars say that the reason why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam boycotted his wives, it goes back to the incident when Hafsa spread the secret of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That somewhere along the line, Hafsa, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought Madia to her house, and then Hafsa saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam coming out of the house with Madia, and she confronted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about bringing Madia into her house. Madia was his concubine at the time, uh, and Hafsa was upset that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know, brought Madia to her house. And Hafsa said, you would have never done that to Aisha. Why you do that to me? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in an attempt to make right what he made wrong, it, he said to Hafsa, that if you desire, I will never sleep with Madia again. She is my right hand possession. I am free to sleep with her as at will. But to satisfy you, because I feel like I wronged you, I will never sleep with Madia again. However, do not tell anybody about this. This was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's promise to Hafsa. Don't he made her promise him? Don't tell anybody about this. And what does Hafsa do? She goes immediately to Aisha, guess what happened, and she tells Aisha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures this in the Quran. And remember when the Prophet Wasallam disclosed something in secret to uh, his wife, one of his wives. And um, she went and she exposed it. She went and she exposed it to Aisha. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Aisha, you know, in Surah Al-Tahreem, this is the Surah, I believe it's Surah number 66 in the Quran, Surah Al-Tahreem, right? And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins, Ya ayyuhal nabiyyu lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak tabatari maradata azwaj. O Prophet, why do you make haram upon yourself when Allah made halal seeking to please your wife? Meaning, why did you make Madi a haram for you when Allah made her halal for you trying to please your wife? Right? And so, Hafsa went and told Aisha what happened. After the Prophet Wasallam asked her not to say anything to anyone. So some scholars say the reason why he boycotted his wives was because of what Aisha and Hafsa did. Some scholars say the reason why the Prophet Wasallam boycotted his wives is because they begin to see you know, Islam spreading, and after many of the wars and the battles, they would come back with large, you know, sums of, you know, the war booty, the war, you know, the spoils of war. And the Prophet Sallallahu wives begin to ask him for more of, you know, the worldly things. They begin to ask, well, why don't we have this, or why don't we have that? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi coming back from the battles empty-handed. Meanwhile, this person has, you know, armor, this person has gold, this person has camels, this person has this. And so when the Prophet Sallallahu comes back to his family, they're looking at him like, well, what did you bring back for us? You give this person this and give this person that and give this person this and you don't bring anything back for your family. So now they're requesting more of the dunya from him. And it became overwhelming for the Prophet Sallallahu So some scholars say that was the reason. And the Hafid ibn Hajar, this is one of the things I love about the Hafid ibn Hajar, he said, that the reason why the Prophet ﷺ got angry at his wives and decided to avoid them or boycott them is either because of one of these two incidents, as the scholars mentioned, but he said that it's possible that it was a combination or a culmination of all of them. يحتمل أن يكون مجموع هذه الأشياء وكان سبب اعتزاله لهن. That there's a possibility that it was a culmination of all of these things. All of these things happening around the same time. The Prophet ﷺ becoming overwhelmed by you know 
uh, Hafsa telling his secret to Aisha, the, the wives asking him for more of the dunya. And so he becomes overwhelmed by these things and he decides, I'm going to stay away from you guys. He took an oath that I'm going to boycott you for an entire month. He's going to boycott them for an entire month. He's going to boycott them for an entire month. That was his oath. He took an oath that I'm going to boycott my wives for an entire month. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals an ayah to him during this time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals an ayah to him during this time. I'm going to stop the, um, because I see it going in and out, I'm going to stop the Instagram and the Facebook and I'm going to restart it again. All right. Um, and we'll get to that, inshallah. All right. I'm going to stop it and then I'm, uh, Unless you guys can hear, it looks like it keeps going in and out. If you guys can hear, then that's fine. I'm not. I'm not going to stop it. But if you're having a hard time hearing, then inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to start it over. Okay. So someone asked, uh, so he can do that? Yes. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an. In the Qur'an, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed an ayah where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, uh, if a man fears, right? If a man fears, uh, nushus. I want you guys to memorize this ayah or, or memorize this, this term or this phrase, nushus. Nun, shin, wow, zay. Nushus. Nushus is what's called marital discord on behalf of the woman. So the woman kind of initiates marital discord, either due to the fact that she's not giving her husband her rights or due to the fact that she's exhibiting certain, certain behaviors that are causing a conflict in the marriage with her husband. This is what's called nushus. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that if a man fears nushus, Marital discord on behalf of the wife, then he should admonish her. And if the admonishing her doesn't work, then he should boycott her in the home. Then boycott her in the home. So that is actually mentioned in the ayat from the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, I believe. Um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the man, uh, sorry, uh, Surah number 4, ayat 34. If you have the Quran open, or if you have the English translation of the Quran, turn to that ayat, Surah number 4, ayat 34. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاللَّاتِ تَخَافُونَ نُشُوزَهُنَّ And those women... Allah's talking to the husbands here. Those women on whose part you fear nushus, marital discord, fa'iduhunna, then admonish them. Constructive criticism, admonish them. Wahjuruhunna fil madajah. And then if that doesn't work, boycott them in the home. So this is a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to boycott the woman in the home. So what does boycotting Intel. Not only that, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in an authentic hadith where a man came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, ma haqqa zawjati ahalina alayhi. O Messenger of Allah, what is the right of one of our wives over us? Is boycotting allowed when she doesn't live in the home and no contact for three months? We'll get in. That's that's abandonment. When a man just leaves the home and doesn't communicate with his wife, doesn't, you know, is not intimate with her, doesn't seek to reconcile anything. That's abandonment. That's different than boycotting. And I want us to make a clear distinction between the two. Abandonment is just completely abandoning the home, leaving the woman, leaving the children, no communication, no talking, no checking in on you, no nothing. You don't hear from this guy. Weeks and weeks and weeks go by. You don't hear from him. That is not boycotting. That is abandonment. Completely different subject. Completely different subject. Although there is some overlapping here that I'll get to, but that is not boycotting. That is not what the Prophet ﷺ did. 
And any man who uses that and justifies that by saying, well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam boycotted his wives outside the home. First of all, the compartment where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived was right above the masjid. So his houses were right around the masjid. So it wasn't like he was like he could still see them every day. You know what I'm saying? Like he could still look out of his window, look out the compartment window and see his wives and see the community. And this was actually during the time the Prophet Sallallahu broke his leg, actually. He fell off his horse and he broke his leg. And so that was one of the reasons why he did not come out of the compartment to come into the masjid to pray. And the Sahaba would go visit him and pray in the little room with him while he was there. And that was because he couldn't walk. All right. This was at the time when he used to sit down and pray. This was around the time that that happened as well. All right. So. The Prophet Sallallahu he was asked by one of the Sahaba, what is the right of one of our wives over him? Listen to what the Prophet said. And to that you feed her when you feed yourself. And you clothe her when you clothe yourself. And don't insult her. Don't call her out of her name. Don't call her, you know, use profane vile language when you're talking to your wife don't don't insult her that took up there excuse me one second. He said, La tukabbih. Don't insult her. La tawdrib al waj. Don't strike her in the face. Wala tahjur illa fil madajir. And do not boycott her except in the home. So now you have an ayah from the Quran, Surah number 4, ayah 34. And then you have a hadith from the Prophet, وسلم, both of which say, do not boycott the woman except in the home. Obviously, there are times in which leaving the man, leaving the home is probably necessary. There are times when the situation gets heated, when the situation becomes violent or has the propensity to become violent. Yes, in that situation, the man should probably leave the home. Either because he doesn't want to put his hands on her or vice versa, he doesn't want her to put her hands on him. And some women are, can be very vicious. They attack you verbally and they attack you physically. And then when you seek to leave to put some distance between you and her because you see how Shaitan has the woman going, she'll try to stop you from leaving. And it's just like, why are you stopping him from leaving? If he goes to grab the doorknob handle and you jump in front of the door because you don't want him to leave, you are now provoking. You're provoking. And uh, I'll, I'll be it, some women... They believe that the only way that a man can show her that he really loves her is when he puts his hands on her. And I said, that's really a sad thing that some women have been abused for so long in their lives that they have conflated. They have conflated love with abuse. Some women think that a man loves her when he puts his hands on her. And so she'll provoke him. To get violent with her. She'll provoke him to get violent with her. Because in her mind, that's the way he shows me that he loves me. If he puts his hands on me. If a man is going for the doorknob handle to get out of the door, why jump in front of the door when you see the situation is already heated? Why? Provoke him. Provoke this type of behavior. SubhanAllah, let the man leave. You see the situation is heated. You see shaitan is all in between you two. <laughs> but you're going to jump in front of the door to stop him from leaving because you want to continue to verbally abuse him. You want to continue to possibly physically abuse him. And you want him to stay and receive that type of behavior. I'm sorry, no. No, not at all. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Shaytan, he said, in the Shaytan, Yajrifi Ibn Adam Majr al-Dam. The Shaytan flows through the child of Adam like blood. 
Meaning we have a tendency to respond to these demonic suggestions from Shaitan naturally. So if you see that there is, you know, contention, there's there's some tension between the husband and the wife, and she's raising her voice and she's becoming disrespectful, she's becoming belligerent and vile and profane in her in her talking and possibly trying to provoke him to put his hands on her. Get out of there. I'm telling you as a man, leave. Get out. Get out. Even if it means you say to her, I'm going to the bathroom, you go in the bathroom, lock the door. If there's a window, then jump out the window because she's trying to provoke you. She's trying to provoke you. Don't fall for that. So there are situations where um, it might be a great idea for the man to leave the home. But if the situation is has not reached that level and the man is just you know agitated by certain behaviors from the woman, then boycotting her in the home is what is legislated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, What Judah wouldn't have been Malaja, boycott her in the home. The Prophet Sallallahu said in the hadith, don't insult her, don't strike her in the face, and only boycott her in the home. What part of that we don't understand? What part of that we don't understand? So when this, there are some situations that are toxic, that are unhealthy, and the man needs to head for the door. All right. But if it's not that serious, then, you know, if you're in your feelings and men, we need to learn how to be in our feelings, but still stay in our homes. <laughs> you're in your feelings, but still stay in your home. Just because you're in your feelings don't mean that you have to leave unless you're going to the masjid. Right. Doing what Ali bin Abi Talib anhu, did when the Prophet وسلم, went to go visit uh, Fatima and he asked Fatima, where's Ali? Where's your husband? And she said, can a bait in a shame. You know, me between me and Ali, we had we had some problems between us. And he left. So the Prophet وسلم, said, Well, go find him. Go find out where he is. So Fatima leaves out of the house. Where did she find Ali? Where did she find him? Did she find him at the, the corner bar? Did she find him at the club? Did she go and find him at some woman's house because he's mad and he's upset? Like, I mean, like, where do we get this childish behavior. Oh, I'm mad and I'm upset. So you're going to go drink? You're going to go to the bar and go drink because you're mad? <laughs> you're going to go sleep with a woman because you upset with your wife? Are you serious? That, that's what we do when we get mad, when we get angry? So Islam, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes out of the window because you're upset and then you think that you're going to get a pass for that? <laughs> you still have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to say, well, you were angry, so I'm going to excuse you. You're excused. You were angry. I get it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets angry with us at times, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still doesn't even punish us. He gives us an opportunity. One of Allah's names is Al-Halim. He is tolerant. <laughs> but you don't get a pass because you're angry. That's stuff that we did when we were 12, 13, 14 years old, not 30, 35, 37, 40. You get angry and you leave out and you go do something irresponsible. That's not anger. <laughs> That's irresponsibility. It just took the right situation to bring it out of you. You were irresponsible, period. There are many men that get angry every single day, but we don't necessarily go out and do something that's irresponsible. Something that we're going to have to go back and answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for on the day of judgment. Under the guise that I was angry, I was upset. You, you serious? So you go sleep with somebody because you, you go risk your jannah, you go risk your paradise because you were angry? La ilaha illallah. Where did Fatima find Ali bin Abi Talib? The Prophet Sallallahu said, go find him. She goes out the house to go find him. Where did she find him? She found him in the masjid. He left. He left out of the house, but he went to the masjid. She came back and she told the Prophet Sallallahu he's in the masjid. The Prophet Sallallahu goes to the masjid. He finds Ali sleep on the floor in the masjid. And he had been laying there for so long that, you know, the, the, the sandstorms come by. If you've ever been to Arabia or Egypt, you see the sandstorms come by blowing sand and, you know, in your face. So he's laying on the masjid floor, which is sand. 
And as he's laying there, the sandstorm comes by and is blowing sand on his back. He's almost covered in dirt. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes to the masjid to find him covered in dirt and he begins to dust him off. He's saying, Qum ya Aba Turab. Qum ya Aba Turab. Get up, O oh father of the dirt. That's where he got the nickname Abu Turab, father of the dirt. Right? But she found him in the masjid. Not out doing something irresponsible because he was angry. All right. And so the point that I'm making is that, you know, in Islam, boycotting is allowed in the home. In the home. Boycott her in the home. So what does boycotting entail? What does that mean to boycott your wife? What does that entail? That entails possibly not speaking to her, pass by her in the kitchen and, you know, you want something to eat? No, nah, I'm good. You know, that's my favorite line. <laughs> nope, keep your food to yourself. I'm good. I'll order out. I'm cool. You know, and, and a woman is really a, offended by that, especially if she knows that you love her food and then you choose not to eat her food. So what you're doing is you're trying to get her to see that there is something about your behavior that is troubling me, that's bothering me, Right? Something about, you know, your behavior that's troubling me, is bothering me. So there's certain things that I used to do that was normal between us that I'm going to stop doing until you take a look at that behavior. So maybe you're the type of man who comes home and the first thing you do when you enter into your home is you give your wife a kiss. No matter where she is, you drop your things, you go find her in the home and you give her a kiss. She's standing in the kitchen, you come behind her, you grab her from behind, and you kiss her on the neck, or you kiss her on the cheek, how was your day? That's the normal behavior. But when you are agitated because of some behavior that she has refused to correct, when you come in the home now, you don't kiss her. You come in the home, salam and you don't kiss her. And she, if she was accustomed to that, that's going to affect her. Because she's used to receiving that type of treatment. But because of the behavior that you're trying to get her to recognize that is troubling you, that's bothering you, then you're going you're gonna to stop doing the things that you used to normally do until she corrects the behavior. And she's, if she loves you, she's going and she's affected by the, the fact that you're not doing that on a regular basis. We're creatures of habit as human beings. We're creatures of habit. <laughs> So when, you know, a woman is not receiving that, and, and this is especially true if that's her love language. If her love language is, you know, physical touch, that's one of the, 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 the many love languages. If her love language is physical touch, and she really enjoys the fact that when you come home, you stop what you're doing, you find wherever she is in the home, whether she's upstairs, whether she's downstairs, whether she's in the kitchen, doesn't matter where she is, you find out where she is, and you rush to her to kiss her, how was your day, I missed you, blah, 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 and that's your norm every day. But because she has done something that agitated you, that upset you, that is troubling you, and she refuses to correct that behavior, then and because of that, you decide that, you know, I'm not going to resume this behavior until you correct that. Right? And if she really loves you, if she's really affected by that, she really enjoys that, and she really requires that from you, that will be, you know, something to cause her to, you know, motivate her to take a look at it. And, you know, most women will, you know, sit for a moment and, you know, process everything and come back and apologize and say, hey, you know, I know, you know, me doing this or me saying that, you know, it bothers you and I'm really going to work on that. Right. I'm really going to do better with that. I'm, I'm sorry. I do apologize. You know, and of course, that takes that takes a real woman to do that. That takes, you know, a certain type of woman to do that. Some women just think, as I mentioned in the chutzpah, some women just think that. That, okay, I'm going to get in bed with no clothes on and I'm going to pull up, you know, close to you and then, you know, maybe we can be intimate. And then that's my way of apologizing. That's not an apology. Intimacy is not an apology. When you do that as a woman, when you use sex, you use intimacy as a way of basically saying I'm sorry without actually saying I'm sorry. It's dismissive. It's dismissive of our feelings as men. 
It's like, oh, you'll get over it. I'll just throw something, I'll throw something your way. I'll put on something nice tonight, and when we get in the bed, you know, and we'll resume, you know, our sexual intimacy, and, you know, that'll be enough to shut you up. You know, no, I'm sorry. Keep that over there. I'm good. This is, draw a line in the bed. No, I'm good. You stay on your side, I'm on my side. You know, I, no, I'm good. I'm good. And women are definitely cognizant of that if the man has multiple wives because he could deny you sexual intimacy and go to his other wife when it's her day. I don't necessarily need your sexual intimacy because I have another wife. I have options. You understand? So that is something that will definitely make a woman be, you know, a little bit more cognizant of that. Right. God forbid he leaves your house upset with you, angry with you, and then he goes and finds peace at his otherwise house. That's definitely not something that you want. What is the difference between boycotting and the home of being passive aggressive? Passive aggressive is something is wrong, but you are not stating what is wrong and you're doing, you know, little things to agitate the person without actually stating what's the problem. And so that's passive aggressive behavior. This is not passive aggressive because you know that there's a problem. The man may have said, you know, to you before, you know, I've told you before not to do that or not to say that or, you know, don't go there. You know, and you continuously keep doing this. You know, like you're not going to boycott the woman because she did it one time. You're not going to boycott the woman because she did or said something that agitated you the first time. The first thing that Allah mentions in the ayah is fa'idhuhunna admonish her. So if a man brings something to a woman's attention that is troubling him or bothering him and she fixes it, then we go back to normal behavior. It's not like, oh, you did this once and so I'm boycotting you. You know, no, it's like this is something that is ongoing and you have yet to correct it. And it's bothering me, it's agitating me, it's, it's, it's troubling me. And until you start to take a more serious look at that, I'm not going to resume our normal behavior. I'm, I'm going to avoid. So boycotting doesn't just mean not giving salams or not talking to each other. It could mean just avoid doing the normal things that you do. If you were the type of man who brought roses home, you know, once a week to your to your wife and you change the roses out, you swap them out every week. You know, you throw the old ones away, bring the new ones in rather than doing that. No, let the old ones stay where they are. Those roses been there for God knows how long. I'm not changing them out. I'm not swapping them out until you take a look at this behavior. We keep having the same conversation over and over again. If, you know, you were the type that, you know, took your wife on, you know, shopping sprees or whatever it was that you did with your wife that, you know, she really enjoyed, you just stopped doing that. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you're in the home with her. You don't talk to her. You don't say anything to her. But there's other ways in which boycotting can manifest. There are other ways in which the boycotting can manifest. The, the goal, the overall goal is not to just avoid her, but to get her to take a deeper look at the behavior that is troubling you. That's the goal. And when you achieve your goal, then you stop the boycott. As Allah mentions at the end of the ayah, And when they return back to obedience to you, then do not seek a way of agitating her any further. Do not agitate her any further. Don't continue to press on the gas. Once she's shown remorse, once she's shown that she's sorrowful and remorseful for, you know, her behavior and she returns back to, you know, obedience to you or compliance with your demands as a husband, then in that case, you stop. You don't continue to go because the goal is not to hurt her. The goal, as a man, you're not trying to hurt her. You're trying to get her to take a deeper look at some behavior that she's doing that continues to agitate you. The goal is not to hurt her, inflict pain on her. There's some women who their husbands, they leave out. The woman is texting you, I'm sorry, please, let's come back, let's talk. And you're just completely ignoring her. What do you do when even you go to the extreme and she knows and she's still unapologetic, she still doesn't see the problem, uh, still disobedient? Then perhaps you need third party intervention. In that case, you need intervention. As Allah mentions in another ayah, 
that, you know, if you fear separation, you know, in the case you fear separation, then bring an arbiter from her family, an arbiter from your family, right? So now you need third party intervention. You might need to see a counselor. You might need to go to counseling, therapy, you know, that is now the next level of that. If the person is not willing to take a look at their behavior, then possibly they don't, they don't see anything wrong with what they're doing. Or they're not making an effort to change. There's no motivation to change. And so in that case, you probably need her to see that from another lens. Perhaps you're constantly telling the person the same thing over and over again. And because there's some resentment there, they're not really hearing you. So maybe you need to hear it from somebody else. All right. And that's when third party intervention comes into play. And um, hopefully somebody else will be able to get her to see, you know, the error of her ways. All right. So how long should a man, right? How long should a man or how long can a man boycott his wife? The Lejna ad the permanent committee uh, in Saudi Arabia, the permanent committee, they said, من هجر زوجته أكثر من ثلاثة أشهر. Whoever boycotts his wife for more than three months, if he is doing it because of nushus, because of marital discord on her point, on her part, and that behavior is not being corrected, then he is justified. فإنه يهجرها في المضاجع ما شاء. That he can boycott her in the home for as long as he likes until that behavior is corrected. Demon that as you know to teach her some you know a form of teaching her some manners you know like I'm not going to let you talk to me like that I'm not going to let you you know just treat me like that. For example, you know a woman may have a habit of you know just kind of disregarding her husband and leaving out at certain times at night where the husband is not comfortable with that. He may have expressed to her on multiple occasions that I am not comfortable with you leaving out of the house at a certain time and you continue to do it. So until you correct that behavior, I'm no longer going to do X, Y, and Z. And I mean, if the if it gets extreme, a man could actually stop paying rent, stop paying mortgage, stop, you know, buying clothes, buying, you know, the luxuries. The man can stop doing that. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, the Prophet Wasallam said, one of the things that will prevent Allah from answering, one of the things that will stop Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from answering the dua of the servant is if he keeps a rebellious, disobedient wife under his auspices, under his authority. Absolutely. That's one of the things that will stop Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from answering your dua is that you are married to a woman who is completely disrespectful and disobedient to you, has no regard for you as a husband, has reduced your role to a cuckold. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reject your dua, will not answer your dua. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the scholars they also consider they also say فَإِذَا مَضَتْ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرَ وَلَمْ يَرْجَعْ إِلَى زَوْجَتِهِ وَيَطْعَهَا that if four months go by and the man does not return back to his wife and does not you know resume intimacy with him because that is one of her major rights over the husband is she has a right to in intimacy right وَأَبَى فَإِنَّهُ يُؤْمَرُ بِالطَّلَاقِ then he should be commanded to divorce her. So four months is the max. Some scholars say six, some scholars say five, but four months is something that all scholars agree on, that the boycott should not you know, go past four months. And if in fact it reaches that point, then he should be commanded to divorce her. If he refuses to, re to, to divorce her, then uh, they should take their affair to the Muslim judge and the Muslim judge will separate them or annul the marriage himself without whether the man likes it or not. Unfortunately, we don't live, right? Uh, we don't live under Islamic rule. So there's no going to a Muslim court, a Muslim judge. In that case, we need committees. We need, you know, brothers, good brothers, knowledgeable brothers to develop committees whereby we can, you know, arbitrate 
and we can manage some of these marital affairs so sisters don't end up in a situation with a brother who says, I'm not going to divorce you and I'm not granting you a hula. So basically you stuck in this situation. No woman should remain stuck in a situation like that. That's unfair. That is unfair. No woman should remain stuck in a situation where a man is not going to divorce her. He's not going to treat her like a wife. He's not going to divorce her. And he will not honor her khulab, her demand for uh, an annulment of the marriage. And this fatwa was issued by Sheikh Abdulaziz Ibn Baz, Sheikh uh, Abdulaziz Ali Sheikh, Sheikh Saleh Fawzan, as well as Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid, Rahmatullahi Ala Jamia. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on those who have passed away, Sheikh Ibn Baz and Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid. Um, so this was the fatwa that they, in, they, they issued, and that is that the boycott should not go beyond four months. Anytime after the four-month mark, the woman has a right to request that the man either resume, you know, we rectify and we resume our marital uh, affairs, or uh, you answer my request or respond to my request for a khula, for an annulment of the marriage. So the Prophet Sallallahu in that moment, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed an ayah to him that we will continue this discussion inshallah on Sunday. All right. We have been going now uh, since six. It's nine o'clock now, inshallah ta'ala. I'll make another appeal to everyone to please uh, be generous with your sadaqah, your donations. Please donate Roda Islamic Center. Bi'idhnillah ta'ala. So much more that we need to cover with this story. Bi'idhnillah. We'll continue, inshallah, on Sunday. Sunday, inshallah ta'ala, perhaps around 6. Uh, then, inshallah, or 5. Uh, I'll let you guys know on Sunday, inshallah. Uh, but we will continue on Sunday and we'll finish it off. All right? Please be generous with your sadaqah. Please be generous uh, with your donations. Your donations are much appreciated. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all for attending. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allow us to continue to learn and benefit from one another. Bi idni lahi ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam at taslim in kathira. It's Friday. Take advantage of the opportunity, the, the moments that are left. For those of you who are on the West Coast or uh, Maghrib has yet to come in yet, take advantage. Those of us on the East Coast, with Allah uh, we've already made it past Friday, but the opportunity to do good is always there. Take advantage, seize the opportunity to do good uh, and uh, find ways, you know, to do good uh, for your soul and for your hereafter. Be in the Allah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.